All right. So we are finishing up our study uh, on um, in Revelation chapter 2, the, the church at uh, Thyatira. Uh, we talked about the church at Pergamos, and one of the connections from Pergamos to Thyatira uh, was this issue regarding sexual immorality and eating things sacrificed to idols. Uh, and we discussed uh, last week some of the, the aspects of, of how this individual that Jesus refers to as Jezebel, how she may have kind of incorporated herself somehow among the brethren. And whether she was actually a Christian or simply claimed to be one, that would probably be the most likely way uh, in which she could have kind of ingratiated herself among the brethren. Uh, and again, whether it was, it was certainly deliberate, uh, I believe, her, her purpose in, in what she was doing. It certainly seems as though there's a difference here, verse 21 and verse 23. Uh, Jesus condemns both Jezebel and her children. Again, whether that children is physical children that, that have come from uh, the sins that she's committed or maybe more figurative to represent these women who like her or, and are with her uh, in trying to... to to spread this type of influence among the brethren. Regardless, their time for repentance has passed, or Jezebel's time for repentance has passed. And Jesus says, I will kill her children with death. Uh, verse 22, those brethren who are involved in these sins, again, whether this is blatant idolatry, or, and I, I wonder if maybe this is more of a combination of idol aspects of worship with the worship of Jehovah, uh, again, as we talked about last week, that's not unprecedented. Uh, we saw that with the, the sons of Eli and how that they were uh, doing things uh, with uh, the women who were coming to offer sacrifices at the tabernacle. Uh, and presumably they were attempting to pass that off as being part of the, what was required to offer sacrifices. Uh, but certainly it's not, it's not unheard of. Certainly Galatians, with Galatia, it was uh, combining elements of the old law with the new law that Paul says was a perversion of the gospel of Christ. And I, I have no doubt that there were efforts to combine, uh, combine elements of idolatry, Greek idolatry and Roman idolatry with the law of Christ. And so this might very well be kind of how that was being done in Thyatira. And so regardless of how this, this influence was taking place and how she was accessing the brethren, again, I, I presume she lied and claimed to be a Christian. I don't believe that she actually was, but she may have been. Um, but regardless, I, I hope, I like, to, I like to hope that she really wasn't, that she just lied about it, not that, she, that, a, that a faithful Christian could go that far off, but we know that that does happen. Uh, but regardless, we find how in verse 23, Jesus then says, uh, All the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, Jesus has emphasized before two concepts uh, to, to multiples of these different churches already. And certainly within the, the presentation of Jesus to John in Revelation 1 is imagery that shows the fact that Jesus knows everything. Nothing escapes his attention. He is the one who's able to know the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, and it is interesting that, uh, and somebody mentioned uh, the possibility that, you know, among idol work, among, among uh, Greek gods and, and the, the Roman gods, it's possible that that type of, of, of uh, teaching and, and worship, maybe they had never even considered the possibility that, a, that there, an all-powerful God could even understand their thoughts and hearts. Uh, that may not have been something that was incorporated in Greek uh, religion. The idea that the gods can know what I'm thinking or, or, or what my, my intent is. Uh, and that's something I hadn't really thought about before, that, that maybe among, among Greek, the Greeks that wasn't something they'd ever thought about or ever knew. Certainly Simon the sorcerer seemed, uh, uh, I don't know how you want to say it, but, but he was certainly... Uh, I think surprised that that Peter was able to tell him exactly what was in his heart and I certainly believe Simon was penitent after that I don't know that that Simon was fully even conscious of the bitterness of, and, and gall that he had in his heart but he did Peter was able to show that to him not because necessarily Peter was had that intuition but because the Holy Spirit uh, and he was able to, to tell Simon that and so it makes me wonder if maybe uh, among that that society that the God, that a God could know the, the heart's 
thoughts and, and the thoughts of the mind and so forth, that that could possibly be a thing. Uh, and so the fact that Jesus says this kind of would, if that were the case, and that among, among the Greek society, this is something new, would be something new to them, uh, that would add even more emphasis to why Jesus says this. Uh, especially if Jezebel attempted to pass herself off as holy, attempted to pass herself off as, again, if she's trying to, to claim that this is a way to worship Jehovah, uh, if she's trying to somehow try to, to marry Christ and, and Jehovah with these actions of adultery and eating things sacrificed to idols or, or the, the idolatrous society and trying to compromise the faith of the brethren, however that worked, Knowing the thoughts of the minds, the hearts, uh, Jesus is the one who knows those things. And then he follows that with, I will give to each one of you according to your works. And I think that's a really interesting follow-up to the fact that he searches the minds and hearts. Of course, Hebrews 4 tells us that the word of God is able to uh, discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. And of course, Jesus is the word. Uh, but certainly at judgment, it's not just our deeds that we're going to answer for or words that we're going to answer for. It's also our thoughts as well. Of course, Jesus makes it clear that we're able to sin with our thought, uh, with our mind. It's not just doing works of sin. We can sin with our, even with our thoughts if we allow our thoughts to go places they shouldn't. But the fact that Jesus says, the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts that's really interesting that Jesus specifically points that out, that this is one of the lessons that the churches will learn from my punishment of Jezebel and her children. They will learn. And so that, that really suggests to me that there is something, some type of deceit going on here. Uh, I, I don't know that it was blatant. I, I certainly would hope that the brethren wouldn't fall into something obviously blatant that's obviously sinful and you know, and so forth, a contrary to God. Maybe they were convinced, they were deceived, obviously, deceived into thinking that maybe this is how we're supposed to worship, deceived into thinking it's okay to compromise our faith or, or whatever. But there had to have been something going to the thought and intent, the motivation of Jezebel and of her children, perhaps, that Jesus is saying this. That it's not just, I mean, if it were just Jezebel and her children and the things that they did, which certainly those are condemned, I, I would think that Jesus would say, I am he who sees all things. And of course he does. He says, I'll give it to each one of you according to your works. But, but he emphasizes that secret aspect, that part that, that human being, the natural human instinct or thought process would be, nobody knows what I'm thinking. Nobody knows what's in my heart. I can trick people. I can deceive people. And again, add to that perhaps the emphasis of, in Greek society, if the gods couldn't read the hearts and minds of, of people, of human beings. Here's Jesus who can. Uh, and, and so it just kind of might add emphasis to that component that Jezebel may have thought she was getting away with something. And Jesus is very clear she's not. But, and certainly those brethren who have involved herself in, in whatever influence this was, however this was being applied, they're going to have great tribulation if they don't repent. And then he follows that up with, I will give to each one according to your works. And certainly there's that component as well that Jesus says that which defiles a person is that which comes, starts with evil thoughts. Then from evil thoughts comes actions that are evil. Uh, and so I do think it's interesting that Jesus says, I search the mind and the heart and I will I'll give to each one of you according to your works. Th that can be read as a encouragement in the, in, the, in the sense that, obviously, those who do that which is right and faithful, there's a home in heaven. But given the context here at the end of verse 23, I don't think that's what Jesus means. I don't think this is being meant as an encouragement. I think this is meant as a warning uh, and, and certainly as a threat. I mean, Jesus, to all of these churches among whom there was some sin or something wrong, he says, if you don't change, if you don't repent, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, and Jesus, I have no doubt that if they didn't do it, he, he brought that about one way or the other, and it may not have been overnight, but he certainly brought about the judgment that he, that he told them he would. Uh, but certainly here in verse 23, I think this is meant more as a, as a warning. But I know, I see everything you're doing, but it's not just what you're doing. I see everything you think. I know everything that's in your heart. You can't get away with anything. And you couple that with 
Ananias and Sapphira. And the, the purpose for which God, I mean, yes, yeah, certainly they sinned, but also, you know, when God struck them down, what was the, the reaction of the brethren in the church? Fear. Fear spread through all of them because all of a sudden you cannot lie to God. Okay, as we talked about on Sunday, you can't lie. You can, you can, you can attempt to deceive, uh, but, but you, can't, you can't lie to God. Uh, God knows all things. And the fact that that was manifest in Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira, and it's, I, Jesus doesn't draw a direct link back to Acts 5. There's no reference to Ananias and Sapphira, but there certainly seems to be a common uh, principle that's being applied here of the fear that will spread because of direct physical judgment from Jesus on Jezebel and her children and knowing the thoughts of the heart. You cannot deceive God. Thoughts or comments through verse 23? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and and to a certain extent, I think in some ways, I mean, and we talked one of our daily devotionals this week about how blessed we are to live in the time that we do. In the last two thousand years, having the Word of God available to us, being able to know the full plan of salvation from First Peter one, but. Also, there's, there's the danger of becoming complacent as well. You know, Jesus, there's going to be direct and, and fairly immediate judgment on Jezebel and her children physically that's going to show forth the power of God. Ananias, Sapphira, Herod. Uh, we have examples throughout the New Testament of, of and for that matter, there are examples in the Old Testament of immediate action taken by God to show his wrath or to show his displeasure and in, in what individual or a group of people are doing. The further along we go, as Nolan points out, certainly people trying to, to bring things into the church and, and trying to, that corrupting influence, you know, that's why Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 5, a little leaven does what? It, it spreads. It leavens the whole lump. Just a little bit of leaven can, can leaven a whole lump. And until you, you, you're able to cut out the leaven, it's, it's a danger. It's a problem. Uh, but certainly the, the complacency that can set in in places like some of these churches of Asia, for instance, with Ephesus, uh, you, know, you wonder about what all happened in Ephesus where they had left their first love and somehow it affected their works in some way uh, if that wasn't complacency, if it wasn't maybe some kind of a, a I don't know, some kind of component of of uh, maybe getting further from the, the days of the, of the apostles. Of course, John at this point, presumably the last apostle alive. Those with miraculous gifts are starting to die out. Uh, not as many around as there would have been in the 40s and 50s AD. Uh, and so certainly this is having an impact. I, I think it was having an impact on people uh, and their, their hearts and their minds. And yet Jesus reminds them, it doesn't matter how, how far it goes, 2, 000, another, another 2,000 years, Jesus is still judging the hearts and minds and, and able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart and, and will judge and give to each one according to our works. Joe? Yes. Right. But I think that's certainly, that's who he's addressing here. Yeah. I'm going to take care of her, but yeah. I know all the churches, you don't tolerate that. Yes, absolutely. That's a mindset that is so prevalent now. I'm, I'm going to do what I want to do. You do what you want to do. We're all good. And you we can't tell me I'm wrong. Everything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. That's the Jesus makes that clear. The churches will know. Certainly, uh, Thyatira being one of them, but... This is going to spread, this information, this understanding of what happened to Jezebel. And that 
knowing that, that the letter's being delivered, and I'm guessing shortly after the letter's delivered, something's going to happen. Okay, whatever it is, whatever judgment from, from the Lord is coming upon Jezebel and her children is going to come. Uh, and, and also those who don't repent, it's going to come upon them too. Uh, but that, that message being spread uh, uh, regarding what Jesus says is going to happen and that it's fulfilled, uh, that reminder that, just like Pergamos, I mean, Jesus, he, he acknowledges there's these two different factions there in Pergamos, whether there was any overlap between the two or not. And then he says, I have these things against you, though, because you're allowing these individuals to hold to the doctrine of Balaam. It, it's not unlike 1 Corinthians 5, where it, it wasn't like, even in 1 Corinthians 5, do you remember what they were glorying? What, what, what were they glorying in? Paul says, your glorying is not good. What was happening in 1 Corinthians 5? They were tolerating this man who had his father's wife. Okay, now whether that was being put in the, the frame of look at the diversity we have, the background of lifestyles, I don't know how that was being applied, but they were glorying in it, whatever it was. It wasn't just like they were, well, that's wrong, but we're not going to say anything. Even more than that, they were glorying in it. And yet Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 5, at the end of 1 Corinthians 5, that we're not to keep company with anyone who is a brother or sister in Christ who is involved in sin and will not repent. Uh, and certainly uh, that, that applies, apply, then applies today as well. Uh, but the fact that this is for, for the brethren to understand that, that it's not just, you know, these individuals, yes, they're going to have their judgment, but you are going to be judged as well if you tolerate. And in fact, and that's, and you know, like you said, that's part of what he says here in verse 20. You allow that woman Jezebel. You allow. In fact, he says, I have a few things against you. He doesn't say I have a, I have a few things against some of you uh, or against Jezebel and her children. He says, I have a few things against you. You allow this woman to influence the brethren, and these brethren are taken off into whatever it is, again, however this is being applied, and whether it's direct sexual morality and eating and things sacrificed to idols or, or uh, uh, like blatant, whether it's being combined with the law of Christ or being combined with uh, we can you know, do these things to, to, to conduct our business in Thyatira and it's not really compromising our faith. We you know, offer our libations to the gods. It's not a big deal. You don't believe in the gods anyway. Regardless, it's, uh, it was it kind of a lot of this goes back to knowing the hearts and the minds and the deception that there must have been involved here. Anything else through verse 23? Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. The individual choice to repent of, of whatever sin is there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the fact that it's never too late until it is too late. For Jezebel, it's too late. And, and, and it goes to show that, that Jesus is loving, he is long-suffering, he is merciful, but eventually, does Jesus' long-suffering run out? I mean, Second Peter chapter 3 Consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Okay, the, the fact that, that the day of the Lord is coming, it hasn't come yet. The longer he waits, it's, it's, he's, he's wanting as many as can be saved to be saved. But eventually, one day, that long suffering is going to run out. Well, it had run out for Jezebel. It had run out for her children. And in verse 22, it's going to run out for these brethren who are, who are committing these things with her unless they repent. Uh, and eventually, one day... You know, our time runs out. You know, we talk about, Keith mentions on several occasions, a day closer to, to death or a day closer to the Lord, Lord's return. Either way, we're a day closer. Time is running out for us. It's not getting greater or, or better. It's, it's getting less. Uh, and certainly that knowledge of the fact that, and the sense that Jesus uses that time as well. I gave her time. She didn't. Now, I'm giving these brethren time. If they'll repent. Otherwise, here's what's going to happen. 
Anything else? Then in verse 24, Jesus says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. So Jesus is, he's addressed Jezebel and her children, whomever they may be. He's addressed the erring brethren who are sinning with Jezebel. And I say address, he's, he's talking to the brethren, the, the, the church of Thyatira, but he's talked about them. Now he's going to talk about the rest of the brethren. Those who do not have this doctrine. And what does the term doctrine mean? Teaching, okay, which suggests, again, you know, we talked about well, how was she... How was she ingratiating herself? How was this influence happening? Somehow it was happening through teaching. Okay, again, however that was being applied, it was, it was happening through a perversion of the teaching of the gospel. Uh, but those who have not followed this, and certainly not, not just, they're not just teaching, you're not practicing this, as was the case with these brethren who were falling away with Jezebel. Okay, and then Jesus says, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. Now, I think it's interesting that Jesus uses that phrase, the depths of Satan. And again, I can see him using that regarding either the, the combination of these practices and claiming it's worshiping Jehovah. I could see it being part of combining idolatry with the law of Jesus. I could even see it with regard to compromising our faith in order to continue to do business in Thyatira. But the fact that the depths of Satan, it's kind of a very unique phrase that Jesus uses. Uh, the fact that as they say, you know, we have vernacular sometimes where there's a phrase that we might use uh, and we might say, we might say, you know, we'll use the phrase and so as they say, because this is a, this is a phrase that we are familiar with. It's a phrase that we know. Now, whether Jesus is using it that way, that's more of a modern way of saying things. It's almost uh, as if Jesus is emphasizing something about the situation among those brethren who had fallen into whatever this was that Jezebel was, was teaching or, or influencing them. But the depths of Satan here, it's not degrees of sin. It, I, I wouldn't, it, there's no sense of the degree of sin. Sin is sin, and it doesn't make any difference what it is. But I wonder if Jesus is referring to the, the demonic nature of how it has kind of gotten entangled into the brethren, the way it's kind of been so deceitfully uh, spread among the brethren. I wonder if that's what Jesus is referring to, uh, those who have not given themselves over, allowed themselves to be deceived by whatever this was, allowed themselves to follow through with whatever these sins are, that's what he's referring to as the depths of Satan. Because he calls that doctrine, whatever it was, however it was that that was being applied, he calls that the depths of Satan. Uh, not that any other false teaching is, is not the depths of Satan. But I, I wonder if he's referring to the way it's just kind of grown, the tendrils have kind of slid into the, the teaching and the service of Jesus and has perverted it, has, has tainted it, where some of these brethren have fallen into it. No. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you could, and, and you know, when I when I read this, I think about what Paul says in Galatians one. You know that 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 you have been led astray, you're so soon removed to another doctrine, which isn't another doctrine, it's a perversion of the doctrine of Christ, of the teaching of Christ, of the gospel. Uh, and certainly, I, I don't think that, that that would be any less the depths of Satan, combining old law elements with the law of Christ, circumcision and observation of the Sabbath and, and festivals and so forth. I don't think it would be any less a, a depths of Satan here. But the fact that the idea, there's obvious link to idolatry, I think may be part of also of what Jesus is referring to with regard to the brethren here in Thyatira. Uh, the fact that whatever these roots were, whether it was financial or having to do with the worship of idols, it's, this, is, this is from Satan. 
and I, I think you're right, Nolan, that, that the origin of, of what this is and the fact that he's associating those brethren, <laughs> they're, they're serving Satan. They're not serving me. They may have been convinced or deceived to think they're serving me, but they're not serving me. They're serving Satan. Yeah. And that they believe the fight Satan, they had to experience his Yeah. Yeah. There was there, there was a couple of commentaries that missed and mentioned Gnosticism associated here. And, and Gnosticism, there, there's a, quite a bit to, to Gnosticism. One of the things was uh, it was more of an experience based type of belief system and that to know what sin was, you had to fully envelop yourself in sin so that you could fully understand what sin was, which obviously goes completely contrary to what scriptures teach, but that's what they, that's what they taught. They also taught that only these individuals had certain knowledge, special knowledge that you couldn't get anywhere else. Uh, and some of, the, some of these uh, lost books or lost writings of the New Testament, the books that were left out of the New Testament that, that some of these uh, documentaries and stuff talk about, a lot of those are, are Gnostic writings that refer to secret knowledge or secret experience, uh, secret revelation that you can only get from one source. Whereas we're told by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, what have we been given? All things that pertain to life and godliness. We've been given everything we need. There is nothing secret anymore. All has been revealed uh, that we need to know. But yeah, it, there, it's very possible that there's some kind of a, a, a Gnosticism element uh, to this as well. Yeah. All right, so when he says, I will put on you no other burden, which suggests that he has placed a burden on them. Well, what is that burden? What, what, what has he tasked them to do? Yeah, to, yeah, well, yeah, to repent, okay, first of all, the, the, even the brethren who aren't following this teaching, what do they have to repent of? They, they have been allowing Jezebel to do this, okay, so that is the burden that Jesus has placed on those who have been faithful, but the thing that Jesus has against them is that you've allowed Jezebel to do this, and you need to stop it, okay, now, again, whether Jezebel was a Christian or not, Okay, that, that means making sure that, that these brethren do those things, those, the actions as a church to disfellowship from this woman. First of all, she even claimed to be a Christian. Uh, but second of all, to make sure that all of the brethren are guarded against this sin. And anyone who was refusing to repent and sinning with Jezebel, what needed to be done? It's a disfellowship from them too. You refuse to repent. Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that goes back to the influences that can, uh, get, can compromise the teaching of the gospel. Uh, and so these brethren have not, they, they have not done anything with Jezebel. Okay, now if she's not a Christian and she's just out and about, that's one thing. You can't really do anything about that. But what you can do is the brethren who have been convinced by Jezebel, who have been taken in by Jezebel, deceived by Jezebel, if they refuse to repent and change, You've got a task you need to do, and they have not done that. And that's part of the problem of allowing uh, individuals to remain in sin. And, and there's, a, there's a real big issue uh, among faithful people today. Uh, because out of, out of love for the family of an individual or out of love for that individual, we don't want to, to make them feel bad or we don't want to... We don't want to make them feel like they don't have a place. Well, they do have a place. They have a family who loves them. But what have they done by their actions? They're no longer in fellowship with the Father. Therefore, am I in fellowship with them if they're no longer in fellowship with the Father? I shouldn't be. Okay? If I'm doing what God wants me to do and they're not, that's a problem. Uh, and Jesus, that's the task that he has placed on them. I will put on you no other burden to make sure that you deleaven the lump or, or unleaven the lump, make sure you cut the leaven out if they refuse to change and refuse to repent. That includes Jezebel if she was a part of, somehow had made herself a part of the church, but certainly these brethren who were falling off and away with her. Thoughts or comments to that? Verse 25, hold fast what you have 
till I come. Now, you remember, it's easy to forget because he spends quite a bit of time. Like we said at the very beginning when we were talking about the background here of Thyatira, this is the longest letter written to one of the smallest cities <laughs> that, that we're dealing with. And the fact that Jesus, in verse 19, though, he says, your love, your service, your faith, your patience, these works, have they're actually more than they were at the first. They've actually grown. It's easy to forget that because, you know, then we talk about Jezebel, and we talk about her influence, and some of the brethren falling away. But remember the fact that they, they have actually grown in many ways, except for some of them. Uh, certainly, obviously, they've been led astray. But the one thing they haven't done is the, the, the unfortunate responsibility of disfellowshipping from these brethren who are doing that which is sinful. Hold fast what you have till I come. Those same, that same love and the, the faith and, and being sound in the truth and so forth, all of those things, hold fast. Continue that growth. You know, Peter says, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, and so forth. They were doing that as individuals, presumably, because that's, that's the only way a church grows. You know, sometimes I think we get the, the misunderstanding that if the church grows stronger, then that means all the members grow stronger. Is that how that works? Who, do, what, who makes up the church? Christians do. We do. And if we are weak, what then is the church going to be? Weak. Okay. As the members grow stronger, the church grows stronger. It doesn't work the other way around. Uh, the only way church growth takes place, and by church growth, I'm not talking about numbers of people. I'm talking about conviction and willingness to stand for the truth and resist temptation. The only way that happens for a church is if the individuals are growing. Otherwise, the church isn't going to grow. And what sounds like here is that they had been growing, except for this one problem that had started to ensnare itself among the brethren. Hold fast what you have till I come. Verse 26, he who overcomes... Certainly, and with all of these churches, he mentions he who overcomes. Okay? First of all, the, the, the trial of faith, the, the tri tribulation of life, the testing that even living in Thyatira. Remember, we talked about the fact that Thyatira was a little bit different than, than Smyrna or Ephesus, where these were temple keepers of certain gods, where Caesar worship was abundant, like in Pergamos, uh, and in, in places where there was great persecution because of their simply their simple existence as Christians. Well, in Thyatira, it was a little bit different. It may not have been quite as um, uh, dangerous physically to live in, but there was still that, that temptation of the financial aspect of it, where you, I mean, you couldn't do business without worshiping the idols, or at least pretending to. And Jesus says to he who overcomes, whether that be fi the financial difficulty that's going to come because you're convicted in faith and you refuse to to go along with what your society's doing, whatever, what all is involved, but also overcomes the teaching of Jezebel, overcomes maybe the temptation not to do those things that are necessary for the church to do. To he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Uh, so we'll talk about what, what he says here in just a minute, but he says, it keeps my works until the end. You know, that, it's really interesting because he says back in verse 23, I will give to each one of you according to your works. And then, of course, we talked about the works. I know your works, which included love, service, faith, patience. Your works, the last are more than the first. But then Jesus refers to my works here in verse 26. Keeps my works. And it goes to show uh, kind of that, that, that analogy that is used in Scripture about the potter and the clay. Okay, in order to be that which God wants us to be, it's not just I'm doing you know, the, the, these things because I choose to do them. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, or the saying, claiming that they're good works. Okay? I, I'm doing this, I'm doing this in your name, I'm doing that in your name. I think they're good works. Jesus says, you keep my works. Not your works, my works which goes back to certainly the authority that Jesus gave them and the authority that they had been abiding in, uh, up at least until Jezebel, in doing those works and growing in those works and the application of them. But they belong to Jesus, just like the church belongs to Jesus, just like the brethren belong to Jesus. And you keep my works until the end. Thoughts or comments through the verse, uh, to that part of verse 26. All right, so... Yeah. I think along the lines that you're talking about, it makes you think of the individual responsibility that we have to be sure that false doctrine or practices don't come in. 
Yeah. So while we're a group of people, I'm still going to be held accountable. Absolutely. If I choose to allow a person that is practicing something that goes against God's law, that doesn't let me off the hook. Now. Right. You know, it's my responsibility to tell them. That, you know, um, and I, and can't just turn a blind eye. Yeah. No. Yeah. They're the easy, not the ones that stand up to fight, but the ones that let little things creep in because he knows that it'll grow and if you're apathetic, yeah. you know. And so to me, earlier in class, I had the thought, well, it goes around, comes around. Yeah. No, not really, but the thought was um, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. You know, and, and so we have a, as a congregation, we have to be sure that the truth is being proclaimed appropriately. But also as an individual, I need to be sure that I'm behaving according to the, the truth and right. that I associate with brothers and sisters and not like, oh, it's okay that you have a piano or it's okay that, you know, whatever the issue is. Yeah. Well, and that goes back to Hebrews 5 as well. Having our senses exercised, being skilled in the word of righteousness to have our senses exercised to do what? Discern good and evil. Okay, and if we're not skilled in the word of righteousness, what are we? What is, what, what is, what is, and what does the Hebrew call us? He, huh? Immature. I, immature children. Okay, immature children. And, and that certainly everybody grows and everybody adds to their knowledge, but that, that, that's the emphasis of why we have to grow, to be able to discern that which is right and wrong, because those who aren't able to do that, they're tossed to and fro. Every wind of doctrine, Paul told Timothy about. Every wind of doctrine comes around, oh, that sounds good. Oh, that sounds good, too. And because they're not grounded and, and anchored in God's word, they're not able to discern when they hear something that is not according to what God says. And so they're easily convinced. They're not, they're not gullible. It's not the sense that they're gullible. It's that they're easily convinced because they're not grounded in the truth. Uh, and certainly there may have been some of these brethren in, in Thyatira who were guilty of that. Uh, so, to him I will give power over the nations. Verse 27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. A lot of times, verse 26 and 27 are taken out of context. Okay, uh, there's, there's several false uh, individuals who've, who've taught false things about verse 26 and 27. The aspects of somehow even going so far as to say Jesus is saying that every Christian is going to have their own nation or their own world to rule. Okay, understand Jesus quotes scripture for a reason in verse 27. He's coming from Psalm 2. So understand that when Jesus, and really in a lot of ways, the, all, of the, all scripture that when it's quoted in the New Testament by Jesus or by the apostles, usually it's not limited to just that single quote. They're quoting that because of the context of the situation, wherever it is they're quoting it. So Psalm 2 and in verse 7, between now and next Wednesday night, you can go ahead and read that if you want to, uh, verse 7, particularly verses 7 on through 9, but there's a context here. It's a messianic psalm that Jesus is referring to. And, and so when he, when he says what he says back in, in Revelation uh, chapter 2, we need to, to wonder or ask ourselves if what Jesus is saying here, is it, is it literal in the sense that they're going to be made like kings? Or does he mean, I will give them power of the nations in some other way? And so that, that's where Psalm 2 comes in. We'll talk more about that next Wednesday night. We will finish Thyatira next Wednesday night, and we will start Sardis as well next Wednesday night. Thank you, everybody.